Hey, good morning. Good to see you guys. Nice to worship together and to be in the house of the Lord together. Father, we thank you for your word and your truth, and I do pray for your Holy Spirit to fill me, that I might speak your word as I ought, that it would be full of truth, that it would be, I would just get out of the way of your word and let it do what it does in our lives, encourage and exhort. So Lord, we pray for that, but also for the ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. We want that as well. So if we have a preconceived idea that is going to be in conflict with your clear word, God, give us the grace and the wisdom to be able to just bow our knee to your ways, to your word. We pray for uh, your spirit to move, to restore marriages, to heal marriages, to prepare people for marriages. And um, we are grateful for one another. As we give back to you this morning, Lord, in giving, it's, it's just our way of saying thank you for everything you've given. But also, we believe in the worthiness of the gospel work. It is worth our investment, and what a privilege that we get to do that. So give us wisdom, Lord, as we use these resources for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your honor. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we are in Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 25. Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25. The title of the study is God's Plan for Marriage. That's God's idea. God is the one who comes up with the plan for marriage. It was not an institution that was developed through the ages and then the church or some, you know, body of people got together and said we really ought to codify these relationships that we're forming and having and we'll call it marriage and it'll be between a man and a woman. That's not what happened. What happened was God at the very beginning, the first Moments after creation said, we are going to establish a union that will be holy, that will be purposeful, that will be uh, beneficial, and we're going to call it marriage, and it's going to happen between a man and a woman. And it doesn't matter what else a government or a court or an individual may say, that is God's definition of marriage. It's the way it is. You don't have to agree with it, but you can't deny that's what the Bible teaches. And it's God's way that is the best way. Now, you may think, well, gosh, come on. Look, are we going to go all the way back to Genesis to try and figure out marriage? I mean, we're a little more complicated than they were. Our lives have a lot more challenges going on than Adam and Eve had. I mean, they didn't even have any problems. Why? What could we possibly glean from Genesis chapter 2 before the fall, all those generations ago, that's going to help us in our marriage? Oh, you'd be surprised. You know, the Lord, when he was put, for, put a challenging question, was put to him about marriage and divorce and remarriage, where did he go? He said to the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the experts in the law, they spent their entire life reading the word of God. And Jesus says to them, when they asked him the question, he says, have you not what? Have you not heard? Have you not read? Do you? In other words, Jesus was saying, you guys don't know your Bible very well, do you? Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says, and he takes them back to the book of Genesis. And he says, from the beginning it was not so. And he began to give instruction and teaching to them about the way the marriage unit should be. So, oh yeah, I do believe Genesis is exactly where we need to go. As a matter of fact, we do this in life. And, and things that aren't spiritual. When we want to find out how it was done right, we usually go back to the beginning, right? You ever take a picture of something before you take it apart? <laughs> I, listen, I'm not the most mechanical guy around, so don't ever ask me to work on your car. But, um, but you know, obviously, you, you got to do stuff, right? And if I do it, I'm always, I like, I take the picture first. Because I do not trust myself to put it back together correctly. And more than once I've put it back together, I'm like, uh-oh, they got an extra nut, bolt. <laughs> Where does this thing go? So, I mean, or you look at a manual or you, you look at something that's, you know, uh, put together properly. You go back to the prototype. And this is what we need to do. We need to go back to the way it was established. And there are four main points that we're going to draw this morning from our text. And the first one is, God's plan included companionship. And the Lord God said, verse 18, it is not good 
that man should be alone. The Lord had observed everything that he had made, and he said it was good. And now, here's the first thing that he says, this is not good. It's not good that man should be alone. And so God saw the need for companionship in his creation. In, in Adam, he saw this. And companionship is not just a Adam need, it's a humanity need. We all have the need for each other, for another person to be involved in our life. Someone that would speak to us and listen to us, laugh with us and cry with us. We all have that need. Now I want to say something before we go any further about a message on marriage because there is a significant portion of people in here that are single and you feel, maybe some of you I know feel called to singleness. This is the way God uh, would have you to live your life. So listen, Paul commended that choice. He encouraged that choice for a person to live and, and to be a single person. So there is no failure here. Um, and I don't want anybody to feel like a second class citizen because we're talking about marriage and you happen to be a single person. No, you can give counsel to a married couple too. Like, can that happen? Yeah, Paul was a single person and he wrote the Word of God. So you're a single person. It doesn't mean you can't speak into other people's marriages. So this is as much for you and your ministry as it is for those that are married and their experience that they're living out. So I just want us to have that in our mind. But this is a human need that we have. Whether you're single or you're married, you have the need for companionship. And God created this interaction. So this, this idea that you would isolate yourself and be alone and not have people interacting in your life, it's not a healthy thing. The Bible says that he who isolates himself seeks his own harm. There is help and health that comes from having relationships with other people. And yeah, hurt can come there too. We all know that firsthand, that in relationships, hurt and pain can come from sinful choices that people make or things that are left undone. But we need to be involved with one another. Fellowship is such a key part of who we are as the body of Christ. The gathering together is so much uh, uh, a priority that when talked about it, it said that we should be doing it more and more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. I can't tell you how often to be in the gathering of God's people, but I can tell you that it's supposed to be more and more, not less and less. You can seek the face of the Lord on that one and find out what your schedule is supposed to look at. But this is important for us. He wants us to have people in our lives that we can have a meaningful exchange of information with. And here we're talking about that exchange that happens in marriage. But I want you to notice something. In this passage, Eve is not created yet, so he observes the need for companionship in Adam. He sees that there is a missing element in his experience, and so he makes a woman. And when he makes a woman, he is making her, having observed a need in the man. So when he makes her, we know how women are. We know how God has made them. They love to have the companionship, don't they? I mean, we as men do as well. But I think it's pretty, pretty well agreed upon. And it's not true in every relationship, but it's the woman that usually drives and has that yearning for deep conversation. And it's like, oh, yeah, oh, okay, so you, you thought, but why did you think that? And how did you feel? And how did it make you feel? And like sometimes when Rebecca's asking me, I'm like, I, I don't know. That's just the way it went. I'm not sure how it made me feel. I didn't even think about it. It just happened. And so God has wired women beautifully and wonderfully to help out those who tend to be loners, men. It's not good that you're alone. Now, I know that's not, God wasn't saying, oh, you're a loner, but he was alone. And we tend to draw away as men. We tend to pull back. Yet God has made women and has wired women in such a way that they just can't let that happen. Us guys can. Not to our benefit and not to our credit. We can, we can do that. But not a woman. A woman craves that connection, 
craves that kind of conversation and interaction. So guys, if you're tired of your wife asking questions, there's one person to blame. Walk into the bathroom, look in the mirror, and say, it's your fault. Because <laughs> God saw us, man, and said, oh, I need to create a woman that's going to have this drive to communicate so that she could be fulfilled in that conversation, but that man would also be forced to come and to deal with those things that we can so easily stuff down inside of us that the Lord says, no, you need to talk about it. And so don't get upset at your wife for the way that God made her. And appreciate that and understand that she was made in that way because there was something that would be a compliment to you and to every man who's blessed enough to have a wife. So he wired her that way. Just keep that in mind. But husbands, you should be developing this companionship and this conversation this, this togetherness that God saw and said, oh, he needs to have a companion. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 states that the husband is to love his wife the way Christ loves the church. How does Christ love the church? How does God love his people? Well, one thing we can say without question, and that is he loves to what? Communicate. God is a communicator. I mean, he loves communicating so much that he made certain that what he said and inspired other men to write would be preserved for all time so we could hear the heart of God and make certain that we walk in it. And not only that, he gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And Jesus said that he would come and the Father would make his heart our homes that he might manifest himself to us companionship, communication. This is what we're supposed to be good at, guys. This is what we're to be aiming at, is to be those that communicate because we are to be as Christ is to his church. Jesus, so confident that we would be used to that conversation, said, my sheep, they know me, and they know my voice when I speak. When I talk, they recognize my voice. It might be so long since you've had any kind of meaningful conversation that your wife doesn't even know what your voice sounds like anymore. That's a problem. Well, you know, I, you know I'm just not much of a talker. Oh, you were. <laughs> I can pretty much guarantee there was a moment in your life when you were a talker and you communicated and you made her feel special and you listened to what she had to say because you probably wouldn't have got the second date. Well, she said, well, you know, I just think, you know, that's great that you think things, but I'm not really interested in them. What I'm interested in is just when I talk, you can listen to that, and you can be blessed. What do you say? Want to go out again? No, she's not going out on a second date. She would have been done with you. You pursued her. You wooed her. You drew her in at one point in time, and you proved yourself charming enough to win her heart. So you did it once. And you should continue to do that. Oh, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm not that way anymore. Well, it's time to repent. Ephesians chapter 5 says that the husband, modeling after Jesus, is to nourish and cherish his wife. Those are some pretty tender words, aren't they? Nourish and cherished. Well, I do. She just doesn't know it. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. She needs to know that that she's being nourished by you. She'll experience that. But she also needs to feel that and hear the cherishing that you have for her. She has to hear this. This is what my wife tells me. She says this, and has told me for a long time. She says, you, I, she says, I have chosen that it's only your compliments that will mean anything to me. She says, I don't let other people's compliments hold a, a high value in my life. It's your compliments. And so I need to hear from you. And if you've ever heard, you know, been with us in counseling, you've heard my wife say that many times. And that's true, guys. It's got to be from you. And, and that you said it 10 years ago, that you cherished her and loved her and were nourishing her. It's not that you don't nourish her the way you want to be nourished. 
You nourish her the way she needs to be nourished. And this is the way that companionship works. But again, God saw the man was alone, so he wires somebody who's just all about the companionship to draw us together to complete the picture. And again, typically it's the man that pulls away. It's the man who begins to get quiet. And it's the woman who wants to continue to speak and wants to continue to talk. But you can get to a point where she doesn't want to hear a thing you have to say anymore. And that's a problem. So God's plan included companionship. 1 Peter 3, 7 says that you and I and every husband should dwell with their wives with understanding. And I know a lot of you may be upset. I can't understand my wife. Nobody can figure her out. Except for you. Because you've given, been given a commandment by God that says understand her. All things are possible with God, okay? You can understand her. You can pray for more grace. To the humble, he gives more grace. Lord, give me wisdom to understand her, that I might be that companion to her that she needs, that she might grow into the woman of God that you want her to be. As a matter of fact, in that instruction to the husband, It says that when we don't, when we get bitter towards our wives, when we don't dwell with them in understanding and we're harsh towards them, God says your prayers will be hindered. In other words, you don't want to talk to her, I'm not going to listen to you when you talk to me. You want to have your prayers heard by God? Then you need to be a husband that is walking in obedience. And he says, "Don't, don't be like this, lest your prayers be hindered if you don't see prayers being answered in your life you might want to evaluate your marriage and how you're treating your wife because the Lord is kind of like listen I got one thing to say to you I don't like the way you're treating my daughter and until you get that straightened out I don't have any other conversation to have with you but as soon as you get that straightened out doors wide open to have conversation this is the word of the Lord I'm not just making this stuff up so number one God's plan for marriage included companionship Secondly, God's plan included partnership. Picking up halfway through verse 18, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. Who's looking? I mean, if you can't find, it means suggest somebody's looking. If God knows there's not somebody comparable. Who's looking? It would seem that as the parade of animals coming before the first zoologist, Dr. Adam, and they're looking at all these animals, he was wondering, wow, look at this. There's a male and female like almost everything. But I'm by myself. I mean, there's nobody that looks anything like me. And so he evidently began to sense this need. And he felt, where's, where's somebody that's comparable, that's like me, and could be along my side? So God's plan was for partnership. I want to stop right here because sometimes people seize upon this word helper and they say, this is why you can't trust the Word of God, to understand the role or the, the plan or the, the design that God has for a woman. Because look at this, making her a helper. She's like a little, you know, Santa's elf running around the workshop. That's all she's meant to be. That's, that's what the Bible kind of portrays her as. But that's not what it says. You're infusing those thoughts into the, into the text because it does not say that. And, it, and really... If you want to know what the Bible has to say, this word for helper is picked up again in the New Testament and Jesus uses the word helper to describe who? The Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And Jesus said, I will send a helper to you. Another. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to go away. But I'll send another, meaning one just like me, one that's divine, and he will be a helper. So is this a derogatory statement? Is this a statement that's meant to demean or degrade the third person of the Godhead? Listen, if the, if the second person of the Godhead is using this title for the third person of the Godhead, 
and you happen to be called a helper, you should feel way out of your league with that compliment. That you would be identified as a helper. That's like a word that is used of God in another place. The fact that she is, chapter 1, created in the image of God as man is created in the image of God tells us about her worth and her value right there. But this account also is trying to communicate something. He can't find anybody else that's suitable, that's like him, that's on the same level as him. And so the Lord creates Eve and brings her to man. And in this creation process, now he has one that is comparable and like him. They are to partner together in the work. Helper, that description means there's something to be done. What is there to be done? Well, in, at the end of chapter 1, we read that Adam was to tend the garden. And now we read here um, in chapter 2 that he is also supposed to be one that is naming the animals. So those are, are two things that God gave for Adam to do. So I don't know what that first conversation sounded like, but hey, Eve, um, I'm Adam. Nice to meet you. Um, we got some work to do. Uh, the Lord said that we should like take care of this place and we should name the animals. Great. Love to help. Let's serve the Lord together. And they began that partnership of fulfilling God's plan. Now there'll be other things that will come later. But I want you to notice in this account there's no mention of having children. That's going to come and that certainly is something that God has uh, you know, instituted that, that marriage would have a godly offspring that would be to him. So that certainly is something there. But I want you to notice that it's not there here because don't be confused that, oh, she was just made to have babies. That is not the case. Babies aren't in the conversation yet. The work of the Lord is in focus here. The companionship and the partnership are the two things, which again, I believe, speaks to her value and her worth and her place as an equal next to Adam, not somebody that is beneath her. How about for us? We don't have gardens to tend. We don't even know where the Garden of Eden is. Animals all seem to have their names. What do we do? <laughs> well, we are told that when we put our faith and trust in the Lord that we are born again. Paul in Corinthians talks about us being the new, a new creation. And as a new creation, we are given work to do. Ephesians 2.10 says that we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works. As an individual or as a couple, you are a team if you're a married couple. And you should be that dynamic duo like Aquila and Priscilla serving the Lord and working for the Lord. There's, there's work to be done. Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. The priority of our life and the priority of our marriage should be first and foremost is to have the companionship and serve the Lord in those works that he has given us to do. You know, Rebecca and myself, we, we, we know very clearly what the Lord has placed before us, at least at this hour, and what we're to be doing, and we strive to fulfill that work, and we seek to help each other as we fill, uh, fulfill that calling um, on our lives together as a married couple. But you, you have that too, as a married couple. You're like, yeah, not us. We've messed up too much. Okay, maybe you did mess up, but not too much. Because there's grace and there's forgiveness and there is restoration. And the Lord still wants you to be faithful in serving him. It's so important that we serve God as individuals, but that we serve the Lord as a couple. That this is the thing that's at the center of who we are. When Eve said, hey, I'm here to help. What do I do? Adam was able to give an answer. I'm asking you, husband, if your wife was to come and she should say and ask, how is it that I can stand with you and fulfill the work that the Lord has given us to do? If your answer is, I don't have a clue, you need to go get one. You need to discover that. 
Because it's you two together fulfilling the word of God and the work of God together that's going to give you meaning and purpose that you can't get anywhere else. Buying homes, having babies, pursuing careers, getting education, having vacations, getting your retirement, okay, fine. But where is striving together and laboring together for the work that God has put before us? I believe that so often couples are taken off and they lose track and they lose focus in their marriage because they first have lost purpose, which is provided here in this partnership of ministry. But we all, not just married couples, we all should be serving. We all should be giving ourselves away. Jesus said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. I should not seek to Gain, you know, hold on to my life and gain life because if I do that, I'm going to lose it. I should lose my life because when I lose my life, that's when I'm going to gain it. Or as I like to say, that's when you're really going to find out what living is all about. It's when you are giving yourself away, when you are pouring yourself out. So why is it that we don't serve? Well, some don't fear, serve because you're, you're caught up with the cares of this life. You are too busy doing everything else. You're too busy doing your job. You're too busy with all your family stuff. Yeah, I said that. You're, you're too busy with uh, who, your hobbies, your education, and you have literally no time left over, so says you. You're the one saying, I don't have time to serve the Lord. I'm just too busy. You're right. You are just too busy. And we all will tend to go that way. This world seems like it just continues to ramp up, and there's more for us to do. There's so much, all these things that are supposed to be helpful, and they do help on one level. I mean, listen, they, they just, they keep us busier than ever. You remember when you only had a phone and there was not even an answering machine for that phone? Wow. What would you do to do that for a week? No missed calls. Nobody knows the, the call. I mean, you just, just, just set free. Just, I'll see you when I see you. We'll make some special effort to get together. There's something that was beautiful about that because it didn't have us being, you know, little pieces of us being chipped away all day long. It's hard. There's blessings. I, I mean, I've, I, I've got it. i got voicemail. I, I call people back mostly. <laughs> you, know, I, you didn't call me back. Sorry, call me again. You know, so listen, this is, this is something we've got, we've got to work through. It's to not be so busy that we have no time to serve the Lord. It's not going to go well for you, not for your soul, but for you on accounting day. When you've got to give an account for what you did with your talents. God made you and he gave you talents. When you were born again, he gave you spiritual gifts. The Spirit of God dwells in you. He says he'll empower you to do the work. And there are specific tasks that God has determined for you to do. God has a to-do list with your name on it. And you've got you to fulfill those things. You've got to complete that. I don't know what your list is. I'm still working on my list. And I'm seeking the Lord for it. And I'm walking it out. So sometimes we're just too busy. Sometimes we're just too lazy. We don't want to give up any more time. You know, we have our, our own things that we want to do. And I don't, if I do that, I'm not going to be able to, you know, have my own, you know, my me time. It's important for me to have my me time. Yeah, sure it is. You got a verse for it? I don't find me time verse. I find give yourself away verse. I find die to self verse. I find deny self verse. But me time verse, I don't really know that you have that to stand on. Oh, Jesus got away and he met with the Lord. And if that is me time for you, then yes, you got your verse. But it's a, it's a lethargy. It's a laziness. Or maybe it's a fear. Uh, this is in Numbers 13. The children of Israel didn't want to go in to the, possess the promised land to fulfill that divine purpose they had because they were afraid. They had gone in and they had seen the giants of the land and that those witnesses came back. Ten of them were there. And... Um, you know, uh, you know, they didn't all give a good report. And mo the majority of them were like, no, listen, 10 of them said, listen, this thing's terrible. There's giants in the land. We're like little grasshoppers. And if we go in there, they're going to squash us like bugs. So they persuaded the entire congregation. But there were two that were full of faith. 
Joshua and Caleb, they believed the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Let's go for it. But the ten persuaded the rest and they didn't go in because of fear. And for some of you, you have a fear of stepping out and serving the Lord. You're like, I'm too little. I'm too insignificant. I know I'm going to mess it up. I know I'm not going to do it right. That might be so. Just be glad you didn't hear my first Bible study at 17 years old. That was terrible. I, kept, I had those notes, and I kept them around for about 10 years. And I pulled them out. They're just sitting there. And I pulled them out. I looked. I'm like, what? Like a preschooler do this? I mean, this is... It was so bad on every level. I just, I looked at it, I was just like, ah, oh, this was terrible. But you know what? You keep serving the Lord. You develop that skill. You develop the ability to, to do that job better. And, and pretty soon, you are providing ministry to people that is really needed. But God's grace is there. And, and this fear that keeps you from stepping out, you just need to push that aside. Speaking of fear, you know, how do we deal with serving the Lord and the fear that we have right now with the times that we're living in, the coronavirus? Listen, I don't have a perfect answer for this, so I'm not pretending like I know exactly what you should do or what I should do or we should do. We're seeking the Lord in all this, so I understand that. And many of people in our church, some have chemo, some have um, lung diseases, and, and they're really distancing and staying away. And I'm not, I'm not aiming. I don't have anybody in mind right now. I'm not aiming at those. If that is the wisdom God has given you to walk out, please walk that out. But if it's fear that has gripped our hearts, that is keeping us from serving the Lord, how long will we stay there? They keep saying, I'm not, well, I'm not one that's willing to agree with it, but we've all heard this. Everything's changing. It's not going to go back to normal. All right, so how long are we going to be stuck with this fear thing of, of this virus spreading? And the church has taken a huge step back. I'm not even saying that it's been wrong up until this point. But the church has taken a huge step back. But let's just say for the next year it remains like this. Are we to give up the work that has been divinely given to us by God to do that? So for the next year, yeah, that's right, no, because you know what, at the end of the year or year and a half, and we get to the point that it's finally lifted and the Lord comes back the next day, then what has the church done for the last 18 months? What's my point? My point is the work of the church, you and you and you and you and me and us, is essential. It's a gospel work that has eternal consequences and we can't just back away and just say, oh, well, let's not worry about it. No, we, we must be concerned about the work of the Lord. Now, it's going to take some wisdom. And you need to seek the face of God. And I will let God give you the wisdom for your family on how you walk this out. And, you know, somebody asked me, are you sure you're doing everything right here at the church? And my answer was, no, I'm not. But as it relates to coronavirus and masks and social distancing and everything, I mean, I've had some people who feel like it's been, you know, not a loving thing to not force you guys to wear masks. Uh, you see me wear a mask when I'm not up here, and I've been accused of being, you know, one that doesn't trust in God, all within 24 hours. Okay, all right, we've got opinions. I got that. And I'm not going to necessarily try to persuade you that what your opinion is is wrong as it relates to this. I'm just saying seek the Lord. And this is what I can say confidently. If your decision is driven by fear, that's got to be repented of. Because fear is a sin. We are to be a people of not fear, but people of faith. So if in faith as seeking the Lord, he has given you the wisdom to limit yourself this way and to social distance that way and to wear a mask here, Great. That's beautiful. In faith, you made that decision before God. But if you have made your decisions because you are walking in fear, that is not great. You know, the church is not without historical model on this issue. The second century, there was a pandemic that broke out. And it was called the Antonine Plague. And then in the third century, there was the Cyprian Plague. 
And the author says that plagues, these plagues killed roughly a quarter to a third of the population. It struck down emperors like Marcus Aurelius, Hostilian, Claudius II, Gothicus. And it was ravaging the empire. It was tearing it apart. People were fleeing into the country. They were getting out of places where there's population. The dead bodies were thrown out onto the streets, not understanding the transmission of disease and how that happened. And the corpses were rotting. And if you were found to have symptoms, you were thrown outside and you were basically a walking dead person. And nobody would help you. Nobody would tend to you. You were on your own. And people were dying alone and they were dying in miserable deaths. But there was a group of people in both of those plagues that stepped forward. And it was the church. It was not, no, listen, I'm, not, I'm not reading you scripture. I'm telling you about church history. But it was the church who says, we're going we're to step forward in the face of this fear. Everybody else is afraid. Everybody else is fleeing. But the church says, we'll step forward. And do you want to know what some of the bishops called those people that stepped forward? They were called martyrs. They weren't being persecuted and being put to death, but they were dying as they served and as they ministered. Now, that, that doesn't really relate to this situation that we're in directly other than this. What are we trying to preserve? What are we trying to preserve? I, I, I am all for the things that have happened to, maybe not all of them, okay, maybe not all of them, but I am happy to have a plan to try and make certain this doesn't just spread and go like wildfire and take out massive amounts of people. I, I think, I'm, I'm thankful that we have the science and we have medical professionals that are ministering and serving us and doing all of these things. My daughter is one of them that's doing them. Many of you in here do that. And we are thankful to you, and we appreciate what you're doing. But in the second century, the third century, it was the Christians that did it. And they stepped forward not regarding life. If they can do that, then certainly we can look and say we've got to be, still be on mission. We've still got to be on point with the gospel work. And we can't just quit and stop and wait till a more convenient time. Because we don't know when the Lord's coming back. It's like, well, you don't know he's coming back in a year. You're right. I don't know that. But you don't know that he is coming back in a year. And so should the last lap, the last, you know, stretch of the church before Jesus Christ returns be found sitting idle in fear? I think not. So I challenge you. I'm not offering you a solution. I'm challenging you to seek the face of God and get some wisdom about how you fulfill the partnership you have to fulfill the divine commands of God. So Adam and Eve were created for fellowship and partnership and the work that God gave them. Verse 24, God had a plan that included unity. Verses 21 through 24, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Other creation was taken from the ground, but she was special. And that she was taken from Adam's side. Thomas Aquinas said, For since the woman should not have authority over the man, 1 Timothy 2.12, it would not have been fitting for her to have been formed from his head. Nor since she is not to be despised by the man as if she were but his servile subject, would it have been fitting for her to be formed from his feet. But from the side, right by his heart, to stand shoulder to shoulder with him, to fulfill the work. Oh, the Bible teaches male servant leadership and that a woman should be in submission to that both in the home and male servant leadership in the church. But it in no way takes away from her worth or her value or her ability to contribute. She was brought on to be part of the team. But they were to be unified. Bone of the bone, flesh of the flesh. Be careful of those things that are trying to pull you apart. There are many things that we just do that, that are like that. We, 
We have work, we have job, we have responsibilities, we have ways in which we serve, maybe not with each other, and those things are present. But be careful of those other things that you can begin to insert in your life that are coming in to try and divide. Like you have separate bank accounts, not because it's efficient, but you have separate bank accounts because that's mine. That's mine. I earned that money. And now you're beginning to move in different directions. It's no longer yours. It's now mine. Or the friends that you have and the way your social life is being lived out. It's no longer you guys doing it together. You're doing it separate. Not like here and there, but it's intentional because you want to be a part. These are warnings because it's God's desire that we would be one flesh. John 17, Jesus prayed that the church would be one. Many exhortations through the epistles to walk in unity, to be of the same mind. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. This is the heart and the mind of God. First and foremost for the marriage unit is that you would be together, not being pulled away and being separate. If I have ever done your wedding or if I ever do your wedding, you will hear these words. And you will repeat these words. Wear this ring as a symbol of my love. This ring symbolizes the unending union of my life with yours. Your dreams are now my dreams. Your hopes are my hopes. Your fears are my concern. Your affection is my joy. Your love is my blessing. There's a unity. Now, you may not have had those exact words in your wedding ceremony, but you had something that spoke of the coming together of the oneness. If you had a Christian marriage, I'm certain that minister referred to the unity that you two shared together. It's fundamental that we would be together and not being separate. Do all you can to stay together and to blend your lives together so that you are one flesh. In that wedding ceremony, if you choose to have candles, I'll say something like this. These two lit candles behind us represent different lives, seeing different goals and purposes. But today, you are joined together as a husband and wife. And as the Bible says, the two shall become one, and it is no longer the husband and his goals or the wife and her purposes, but the two of you joined as one, having one goal and one purpose together. This is what we say in the wedding ceremony. We acknowledge the unity. But in your marriage, if you're not careful, you can just start going in separate directions. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I would suggest that it probably was the spiritual separation that began to happen first. Lastly, in verse 25, it says, And they were both naked, and the man and his wife we're not ashamed. God had in his plan for marriage that there would be innocence, that there would be a righteousness. This was something the Lord is pleased about. They become aware of their nakedness and the shame of it and the fear of it. The exploitation of it begins to enter into the human race as a result of it, the abuse of it. But at this point in time, the, there is no sin. And, and if I can just take this as an application point, and this is not an easy point to, ap to apply, by the way, but I mean, let me try it this way, is that God wants us as couples to be a couple that is walking in obedience to him. That our lives and our union with our families would be marked by righteousness. Kind of like what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to be focused on righteous living. You can either spur each other on to righteous living or you can drag each other down in your speech, in your thought life, in your conduct, the things you laugh at, the things you celebrate, the things you do. And that can be negative or positive. There should be an innocence, a righteousness within your marriage. This is the Lord's desire. We live in a day where evil is called good and good is called evil. It's celebrated. It's applauded. You can be affirmed. You can have a special program even if you have a particular rebellion against God. But God honors innocence. God finds beauty in that. Say, well, it's lost. It's gone. The, the fall's happened. Yes, but the second Adam has come. And he has died upon the cross. 
And he imputes to everyone who follows him, transfers to everyone who follows him, righteousness. And I want to close with this verse there in Jude. So turn to the book of Revelation. And after you get to Revelation chapter 1, go back towards the beginning just a little bit further and you're going to find the book of Jude. If you haven't been there lately, you're going to have to pry the pages apart. There's only one chapter. Jude chapter 1, the last two verses of the book. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And here it is. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Ah, so beautiful. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Where do we find this faultless state? Before the glory of his presence. When you get to heaven, believer, and you're in the throne room of God, you're going to feel like you belong there because you will so fully understand and appreciate the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of God that you now have. And you will stand before his presence with exceeding joy, not exceeding dread, not exceeding shame, not exceeding embarrassment. You have been made righteous in Christ Jesus. Listen, it's a beautiful thing to be forgiven. Do you like it when somebody says, I forgive you. I don't want to hear another word about it. This is over. This is done. I'm never going to bring it up again. You are forgiven. I mean, those are some of the most beautiful words you'll ever hear somebody say to you. I forgive you. God has said that to you. And as Christians, we need to remember how amazing it is that you were able to put your head on the pillow last night and sleep with a clear conscience. Don't take that for granted. That you're able to, in a free moment, when your mind is not occupied on something, it doesn't immediately go to the guilt of your life, to the shame of your life. Listen, that's, that is a work of God that gives you that sense of liberty and freedom. Now, if you're a Christian and you've repented 10,000 times for the same thing and it's 10 years later, it's time to let it go. It's time today to be forgiven and to walk in the beauty of that. And if you have somebody around you, let them walk in the beauty of forgiveness before God. We are to show mercy as God has shown mercy to us. So maybe though you're here and you've never received forgiveness and you walk every day with the dread of your actions and they pile up on you higher and higher and the load is getting heavier and heavier and it just, it plagues you. I've got good news for you. You can have that pack cut off today by the Lord himself. He already died on the cross to pay for your sins and he is willing to give you his righteousness in place of that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for your grace that comes into our life. I ask, Lord Jesus, that we would first and foremost that we would live out our marriages the way you have designed them and modeled and planned for them to be. Lord, we don't get to rewrite the script. We see that happening all around us, but you have a plan for marriage and how it should be. And I pray that there would be sweet companionship and there would be focused partnership, that there would be a, a passion for righteousness and innocence and there will be a wholeness and unity in our marriages. Maybe you need to pray for that right now. Because that's been lost. That's been broken in some way. Listen. You want it fixed? It can be fixed. You too hold the answer in your hands. To make changes. To be focused for the kingdom. Be focused to have a love, to be unified. You might have to make some hard decisions, but it's in your hands. You can pray, but you're going to have to do some decision. If you got there, you might have to do some repenting. You might have to rework it and get back to the beginning. Nobody can do it for you, though. Your choices. But if you're here and you're a believer that just has walked in guilt and condemnation for the one thing you did and you can never forgive yourself, I pray you would say, Lord, thank you for forgiveness. 
that, you'll that you can understand that you're faultless before God in his presence right now. You are justified. Maybe you're the reason why your marriage failed. And that is just more than you can almost bear. You're the guilty party. Hey, you, if you've repented, there is grace and mercy and forgiveness from God for you. Yeah, I don't know what sin it is. But God is not honored by you walking in condemnation. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for your wisdom as believers, as families, as individuals, as a church. And the work that you've given us to do, the gospel work, the work of building each other up. Give us wisdom, Lord, to each family to know how to walk this out in these days. Lord, we need your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray.